Hello friends and welcome to the Architecture Enthusiast and to Rockefeller Center designed by Raymond Hood, Harvey Wiley Corbett, Wallace Harrison, L. Andrew Reinhardt and Henry Hofmeister. Built between 1930 and 1939 in New York City. Rockefeller Center was once the world's largest privately owned business and entertainment center rises skyscraper high are nearly four city blocks in the heart of Manhattan. Each building of the city within a city has an established relationship to the others with a 70-story building as the central structure in the group. 50% of the land is left vacant to permit the proper play of light and air and to facilitate the flow of traffic. Also, extensive landscaping is found on both street and rooftop levels. All structures in the original complex were designed in the Art Deco architectural style. Excavation of the site started in 1931 and construction began that September on the first buildings. The first edifice was opened in September 1932 and most of the complex was completed by 1935. The final three buildings were built between 1936 and 1940, although Rockefeller Center was officially completed by November 2, 1939. The construction project employed more than 40,000 people and was considered the largest private construction project at the time. It had cost the equivalent of $1.5 billion in 2019 dollars to construct. Since then, there have been several modifications to the complex. An additional building at 75 Rockefeller Plaza was constructed in 1947, while another at 600 Fifth Avenue was constructed in 1952. Four towers were built along the west side of Sixth Avenue in the 1960s and 1970s, which was the most recent expansion of Rockefeller Center. The Center Theater was the original complex, was demolished in 1954. It is imperative to understand the various constituents that made Rockefeller Center what it is today. A list of buildings alone cannot describe Rockefeller Center. It is not simply a group of interrelated rectilinear prisms, and it's not just another financial corporation. It is a complex of structures which has created a new core for the city of New York. It is a prototype of countless urban renewal projects around the world. It was originally intended to provide the maximum beauty consistent with profitability, a fundamental interrelationship between architecture as an art and building as a business wills. It was the only executed model for the cities of towers that a past generation expected. It anticipated the city of the future. Because it offers the city far more than offices and theater seats, it has been a focal point of Manhattan for more than 80 years and shows no signs of abandoning its position. To me, what makes Rockefeller Center as Rockefeller Center are the variety of activities that continuously happen all under one common roof, continuously drawing some form of crowd and pedestrian movement to it. These activities ensure that there is never a dull moment at the center at any point of time, day, or year. It has more than 30 restaurants, an outdoor ice skating rink, and shops at the street level and underground. It has the murals and statues and flags of the United Nations. It contains public exhibition rooms and broadcasting studios. The center's Christmas tree is probably one of the most famous on earth and its horticultural displays are changed with the seasons. About 350,000 people use the center on every working day and its largest theater, the Radio City Music Hall. In order to understand what Rockefeller Center is, it is imperative to understand what are the constituents or powers that lay in between its precincts. There are 21 buildings that make up Rockefeller Center, occupying 15 acres of land in Midtown Manhattan. 
The RCA building, now Comcast, which towers above the New York skyline, is one of the world's largest privately owned office buildings and the flagship structure of the 17-building complex. It is 70 stories and 850 feet high with a gross area of 2,908,000 square feet. Cathedrals and castles, mansions and museums are designed to be beautiful or grand with practicalities and financial considerations. Sometimes sacrificed to brilliant effect, these typically attract attention from architectural historians and general people alike. These buildings were commissioned by an aesthetically sensitive elite who separated their buildings from the surrounding cities by custom. But in Rockefeller Center, office buildings are created and properly perceived as part of totality of modern cities. When they are outstanding in planning and design and wide-ranging in their influences, they hold a place in the capitalist democracy unparalleled to the monuments of traditional institutions of their time. Multi-building complexes used to be universities and religious establishments and the 19th century factories, but today are the premises of government and corporate employees. Both of these, Rockefeller Center and cathedrals and castles, are monuments conceived by institutions which along with the government were the determining institutions of the day. The strength of these institutions is proclaimed by means of size and height which shape the fabric of the city. However, both cathedrals and office buildings were intended to attract masses of people and to satisfy their demands. They were meeting points, city landmarks, and centers of memorable public life. What Mr. Rockefeller and his associates built was a business and entertainment complex far in advance of its period in the urban scale. It had long been the ambition of far-sighted architects and real estate professionals to develop a large plot for business purposes in the heart of Manhattan under conditions that could utilize fully these three essentials, light, air, and transportation. The spreading acres of the proposed midtown development offered this rare opportunity for the center's original architects. The result was a pioneering three-dimensional approach to urban design. Skyscrapers were planned in relation to one another and to the open space. Each of the original center structures was planned from the inside out, molded into dimensions best adapted to the needs of the prospective tenants, and placed in the three-block plot where it could best contribute to the general architectural plan and provide the fullest exposure to sunlight and free circulation of air. The growing problem of pedestrian and vehicular traffic was anticipated and provided for by such far-sighted concepts as an extra street, Rockefeller Plaza, and an underground passageway, the concourse. Rockefeller Center was designed to attract people practically 24 hours a day for business, shopping, sightseeing, and for dining, theater, or just plain promenading on its tree-shaded esplanades and flower-filled plazas. The modern office structure represented over 5 million square feet of rental space and rose on 12 acres of land which had previously been occupied by antiquated brownstones, speakeasies, and miscellaneous stores and shops. It was the biggest project ever taken by private enterprise requiring the demolition of 228 buildings, relocation of more than 4,000 tenants, and the employment of 75,000 workers. For each worker on the site, an estimated two men worked elsewhere preparing material, bringing the total to 225,000 people. The construction of the Rockefeller Center changed permanently the face of Midtown Manhattan from one of resident use to one of office use. Rockefeller Center provides a variety of entertainment and recreational facilities in its precincts. 
Much of the social and economic success of the center stems from the fact that it was designed and developed with its users in mind. The initial recognition of the need for a wide variety of recreational and dining facilities is a good illustration of its total services concept. A tenant or visitor can choose from 25 restaurants offering everything from a tasty sandwich to a gourmet feast. In addition, two luncheon clubs serve the special requirements of the New York's business and professional leaders. The center also has dedicated spaces for exhibitions of the industrial, scientific, educational, and artistic achievements of mankind. The following places are high in the list of the visitor's magnet. Here are some simple questions that came to my mind. Where so many people come together, how can entertainment and recreation be far behind? After all, what do such a crowd of people do at the end of their work? Go home and sleep? Not really. Do the visitors of Manhattan think of Rockefeller Center as just a cluster of office buildings? Nah. In its day, Radio City Music Hall entertained more than 6 million persons annually, had a seating capacity of 6,200, and is one of the world's largest indoor theaters. In addition to top flight motion pictures, spectacular stage productions are presented, precision dancing and artistry of the resident ballet company, and a superb music of the permanent symphony orchestra. The great stage, 144 feet wide and 67 feet deep, is equipped with a wide variety of stage effects. The equipment includes three giant hydraulic stage elevators, a huge revolving stage, a traveling bandwagon for the orchestra, rain and steam curtains, and the finest lighting and sound systems. Rockefeller Plaza, the north and south street which bisects the development from 48th Street to 51st Streets between 5th Avenue and the Avenue of the Americas, avoids the stagnation of long city blocks and permits the kind of fluidity that attracts and distributes easily and efficiently vast numbers of people and automobiles. The plaza is one of the few private thoroughfares in New York City. It borders the world famous Lower Plaza. The Lower Plaza, though a comparatively small area in a big development, it is indeed responsible for the refashioning of more real estate complexes in the image of the Rockefeller Center than any other single facet of its design. The plaza is a rectangular reservoir of light and air in a skyscraper canyon. Once called the quintessence of city space by a leading architectural publication, it is the setting for ice skating in the winter, al fresco dining in the summer. Over the years, it has drawn millions of people into the center and has served as an efficient traffic sorter for the offices and lobbies, shops and restaurants which surround its periphery. The lower plaza is also the personification of Rockefeller Center's community spirit, the ceremonial town square where distinguished visitors are greeted, important milestones commemorated, and public service events held band concert and choral harmonies entertain and inspire, and the annual arrival here of the most beautiful tree in the world signals the start of Christmas in Manhattan. Equally proficient as a traffic sorter is Center's famed underground pedestrian concourse, which links its buildings and other key skyscrapers in the Rockefeller Center area. More than one and a half miles of passageways lead from the 48th Street on the south to the 52nd Street on the north and from 5th Avenue westward to the Rockefeller Center subway station concourse. Many fascinating shops line the convenient and sheltered pedestrian walkways. The true urban design link of the center is seen here in the form of this vital connection that ensure that each of the prominent buildings is inherently connected to the other. The concourse is the linking spine here that physically holds the whole complex together. Pedestrian paths follow this link and so do the shop lines. 
This feature has raised the concourse from just being a simple connecting service to a gathering location for pedestrians and consumers. It has now become a destination point. The center was responsive to the expected needs of its increasing consumers and that of the city. It was concerned to the increased flow of vehicles as well as the pedestrians. It gave New York City its first parking garage in an office building, a six-story, 700-car fireproof parking facility, which opened in 1939. Equally far-sighted was the off-street loading areas built into the center at the time of its construction. For the first time, extensive landscaping both street and rooftop levels was a planned part of a large real estate project. 15% of the land was reserved for the spacious promenades and plazas that would characterize the Rockefeller Center the world over, and the provision for the Channel Gardens and the six formal beds running from Fifth Avenue to the lower plaza restored Dr. Hossack's dream of maintaining the site as an oasis of beauty in an ever-growing city. During eight months of the year, beginning with the first springtime floral display in the Channel Gardens and ending on Thanksgiving Day, the flags of United Nations member countries are flown every day, weather permitting, along Rockefeller Center and the Esplanade around the lower plaza. As new countries are admitted to the World Organization, their national flags are admitted to the World Organization and their national flags are added to the Center's United Nations flag display. Rockefeller Center was a pioneer in providing complete shopping and service facilities for its tenants and visitors. There are bus and subway connections to all parts of the city. 25 restaurants ranging from coffee shops to gourmet dining and more than 200 air-conditioned shops and services handling everything from amethysts to zippers. The center has its own drug stores, chiropodists, gift shops, bookstores, as well as dozens of dentists, two schools, and 14 banks. There is a United States Post Office, Passport Service, and Weather Bureau. The consulates of 20 foreign nations are located in the center, as are the offices of 16 airlines, 12 railroad lines, and 58 travel and information bureaus. It may at first seem a bit strange to note the effects that the tenants of the Rockefeller Center may have on its urban design character. Though I think if we carefully consider the true characteristics of a successful urban design and which is the power to pull maximum crowd of people at all times of the day, we begin to wonder what is it that people are attracted to a specific site. Recreational activities like clubs, restaurants, pubs, theaters are indeed a great pull. But what if the workplaces of the people were somehow integrated into the urban design character of their site, to the point that it is difficult to determine what came before? People tend to associate themselves with the site, and the site gradually enters the common life of the people, their formal and informal meeting place, eagerness to find work there, or simply to stay on till the evening concert and have fun. Many factors distinguish Rockefeller Center as a prestigious address. Distinctive architecture, excellent services and facilities, and outstanding tenants. The center reminds designers and developers that the architecture of individual buildings need not be exquisite to be functional and improvement to the city that the open spaces do not have to be very large if they are well designed, that people seldom complain about uninteresting side streets if there are compensating amenities close by. The creation of an area that is active day and night is another legacy of Rockefeller Center. To its own city and to the other building projects designed to become essential parts of downtown areas, 
Developers would fare badly if they tried to build large projects without making sure that transit facilities existed to provide a steady flow of shop and restaurant customers. Those who built shoddy shopping centers and failed to supervise the quality of tenants have generally not done well. This is precisely where the role of the planners and designers can never be overemphasized. People who build sunken plazas beside office buildings find that they are unprofitable unless the public can be forced downwards into plaza-level shops. Rockefeller Center did not solve this problem fully. That is not to say that it is architecturally or conceptually perfect. When the building plans were first revealed, they were criticized for being too expensive and dense. People claim that they altered the scale of the neighborhood and would introduce thousands of people into an area with insufficient transit facilities to accommodate them. Later, the management drew criticism from several quarters for its policies regarding painted and sculptural decoration. Some critics wanted more art by Americans, or at least different procedure for selecting artists. Later still, people found the last of the original groups of buildings erected before the Second World War to be less sensitive in design and planning. The center was occasionally chastised for including insufficient space to produce a new park around Midtown office towers, but the architects never intended to bring the country to the city or mix the informality of nature with the strict demands of the site. The center's architects were all urban-based and were generally inclined to do their landscaping in brick and limestone. The post-war growth of the center made some real estate people wonder when the expansion would end. In understanding the facts, there seems to be only one such secret to the successful urban character of Rockefeller Center, and that is its capability to hold interest in such a large amount of people for such large amount of time. The periodic changes in its services that complement the change in the times and the needs of the people have assured the currency of the center today even after almost 80 years after its construction. Most complexes lose their interest over time and tend to degenerate if careful attention is not paid to their relevance in the future years. The urbanity of a complex could be measured in how successful it is in sustaining the people to stay within its premises over large periods of time.